Hello again, my name is Jeff Bees, and I'm here to introduce you to the Lab 1B Time Constant Lab for the Basic Mechanical Measurements Lab. We'll start out with a, a setup overview as more of an update from the previous video, which you should check out if you haven't. Uh, then we'll go into the experimental procedure and then wrap up with some information about calculating the time constant in various ways. So we shall start out with the uh, setup overview. Here we have a uh, picture of what your setup will basically look like in a little bit more condensed form. The sequence of operations generally goes from left to right. The heat gun will be held by a person rather than being held in that position, but it's in this uh, form just for the sake of the picture. Uh, now I'm going to take this image and swap it over to an electronic schematic so that's a little bit more clear and we can uh, focus in on the things that are important. Most of this is actually very similar to the schematic from the last video for Lab 1A. Here, everything to the right is identical. There, the main things that are added here is the rotometer and the heat gun, and we'll also have some special considerations for the thermocouple, uh, which I will talk about these three items in more detail and assume you know the uh, rest of the setup. Here, we will start out with the thermocouple. The last uh, lab part, um, you only used a bare thermocouple, but in this case we will be iterating through three different conditions. First one remaining that bare thermocouple, which I will abbreviate as TC, and then the other two actually have a stainless steel sphere that is attached to the end of the thermocouple in the probe region. One is a 3 8 inch diameter sphere and the other one is a 1 inch diameter sphere. Uh, they are actually attached using thermal glue which is important to know because uh, if the temperature of the thermocouple reaches too high of a value, uh, the thermal glue has been known to melt. And so when you're actually heating up this thermocouple, make sure that those two um, conditions uh, will stay under 150 degrees, um, but I would say target 100 degrees um, just to be safe. Now for the heat gun, there's not a lot to talk about. We see in the image here, uh, we have a switch which has three options, off, cool, and hot. So make sure that you click over twice rather than just once if you want to heat up the thermocouples. Uh, if you want to increase the heat, there is actually a vent on, on this side where the arrow is pointing, which if you close that vent, it'll actually increase the heat. Uh, a safety note here is please do not point the heat gun towards lights, equipment, or people, even if you don't like them. For the rotometer, uh, there are actually a few pieces here. So the rotometer is an air regulator, and it is supplied from a supply line of compressed air, which we have an image here, uh, which you need to turn the valve into the on position, which involves the valve being aligned with the tubing. Uh, if it is perpendicular, it means that the line is closed. There, This line goes to a pressure regulator, which you want to make sure is set to 80 psi. Uh, and then you can use the knob down here on the rotometer to adjust the flow rate um, to anywhere from 0 to 600 um, standard cubic feet per hour. Now, you notice I mentioned the word standard. Um, rather than just saying cubic feet per hour. And the reason why I say that is because when the rotometer was created, it was calibrated to the conditions of 14.696 PSI at a temperature of 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So as the experimental conditions vary from those standard conditions, the flow rate that is being quoted with the rotometer um, actually gets adjusted. For the sake of this experiment, we won't really consider any corrections needed, um, but know if you enter like uh, particularly hot temperatures or really compressible flow regions, um, you will need to make corrections for this. Now as far as the experimental procedure goes, here we've got a very abbreviated form of this experimental procedure, starting with the zeroing process, um, which I will not go into detail because that's in the previous uh, lab video that you can review. Then we want to place the thermocouple roughly one inch away from the rotometer, um, which when you get to the lab you'll notice that there is a clamp um, that is placed conveniently roughly one inch away from the rotometer. So put the uh, thermocouple into that clamp, 
uh, and close it down on it and make sure that it is facing downward so it flows through there. Um, then you'll want to set the rotameter to one of the three flow rates that you'll be testing. So here we've got 200, 400, and 600 SCFH. You'll want to start the heat gun um, on the thermocouple. And you'll want to heat that thermocouple up until it uh, reads um, roughly 100 degrees Celsius. Once it reaches that point, you'll want to shut it down and let the thermocouple cool to about 10% of ambient. Now for the bare thermocouple and the 3 8 inch uh, steel ball um, thermocouple, this won't be a big deal. Um, because it'll cool down relatively quick, but uh, uh, when you get to the one inch diameter ball, um, waiting beyond 10% ambient may be a considerable amount of time, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about on a later slide. Now, you'll see in this table, we have the conditions that you'll be using highlighted in green, and the ones you will not be doing are in red. And the reason why we're not doing these other two is because the, the one inch steel ball already takes a really long time to heat up and cool down at 600 uh, SCFH and so when you get down to 2 and 400 it'll take even longer and so we decided to remove those conditions. This image down here is what you should be viewing on the lab view end of it and this is actually a video which I'll play and kind of narrate over. And so this will be you running uh, one of the conditions, make sure your device name is selected, the thermocouple should be K-type, uh, select a file to save to, make sure that it is saved to a C scratch temp, student data, uh, with your section number, and then uh, the lab that you're doing, in this case lab 1B. And the important part here is that the file ends with a .csv for comma separated variable. And I would recommend moving the sampling rate up to uh, 10,000 hertz since that is within the DAC specifications and then click run. Uh, I would start out just getting an ambient temperature reading um, because the supply line is a little bit colder than real ambient conditions. And once you feel like you've established that long enough, you can start the uh, heat gun up and wait until it gets to roughly 100 degrees and then shut it down. You notice it will overshoot, especially for the um, smaller uh, ball and the bare thermocouple. It goes really quickly. And then try and wait until that gets down to uh, roughly ambient uh, temperature, which I recommend just going all the way for the bare thermocouple and maybe even the 3 8 inch. Um, but don't worry about doing that for the 1 inch as long as you get below 10% of the distance between ambient condition and whatever your maximum is. So in this case, if it's 120 to 20, um, then that's a 100 degree difference, so within 10 degrees. So I mentioned the 1 inch steel ball is takes a long time to heat up and cool down, so I'd recommend saving that condition for last just so that you can work out any kinks of learning how to do the procedure properly and deal with a thermocouple that heats up and cools down a little bit more quickly um, so you can restart um, faster. Um, and then I would recommend, since it takes so long to, to heat up, uh, you want to have the rotameter off for that one inch steel ball um, until you reach about 100 degrees. Otherwise, it'll take a really long time because you're actively cooling it down while you're heating it up. So then for the heating profile, as you're heating it up with the heat gun, it doesn't actually matter how quickly or consistently it heats up as long as you get to a high temperature. Because um, we're not going to be analyzing the heating part. Um, we're actually going to cut off at whatever our maximum temperature is and then only analyze the cooling region. So if you screw up during the heating process, just keep going until you get up to the maximum that you're hoping to reach. Again, with the ice bath, uh, you want to make sure that it is sufficiently cold so there's still ice in there um, and replenish that supply uh, if you think that uh, it looks like it's running a little low. From the last video, remember that the op amp has a zero uh, point offset in its voltage. Um, so keep in mind that the voltage may drift with time. And so you may have to do that zeroing process again if you take too long to do your experimentation. And as I mentioned before, um, typically the supply air is a little bit cooler than ambient, so make sure you get a, a sample set of an ambient temperature. Um, somewhere in between, I don't know, 15 to 30 seconds should be sufficient um, for each trial. Now, as far as uh, the time constant analysis, for the theoretical derivation, 
Um, we start out with the sphere itself um, having a heat storage term um, given by the mass multiplied by the uh, heat capacity multiplied by the uh, derivative of temperature with respect to time, all for the sphere. For figuring out the second piece, we start out with an assumption um, saying that the Biot number, uh, which if you're not familiar with it, is um, the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the characteristic length or diameter of the sphere, um, divided by the thermal conductivity of the sphere acting as a ratio of the uh, heat convection with respect to the heat conduction. Um, and that term uh, is assumed to be less than 0.1, which basically means that the conduction is so much larger than the convection term that the moment the heat is being convected away, the whole sphere can be treated as a uniform temperature. So when we make that assumption, the heat out or Q out term uh, then becomes uh, H for the heat transfer coefficient uh, multiplied by the surface area of the sphere uh, multiplied by the uh, temperature differential um, between the sphere with respect to time and the ambient condition which is considered constant. The H term here is green uh, and that's because uh, this can be derived from the uh, Nusselt number approximation for a sphere in laminar flow. Uh, it has a form very similar to the Biot number. Um, the main difference here is that instead of it being the thermal conductivity of the sphere, it is the thermal conductivity of air. Uh, and this is equal to uh, this long equation here, uh, which is a function of the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number, and the ratio of the viscosity in the ambient region as respect to the viscosity um, near the sphere. The Reynolds number uh, is given as the density multiplied by velocity multiplied by uh, the diameter of the sphere divided by the viscosity. Uh, and this uh, viscosity ratio here we're going to approximate as 1. Once you set this uh, Q storage equal to Q out, um, you can rearrange that equation um, to get this function of temperature with respect to time, which you can see is a first order differential equation. Uh, and since it is a differential equation, um, the constant or the value multiplied by the differential is is called the time constant. Some things to note about the theoretical assumptions is that uh, it only applies to laminar flow over a sphere. And so this won't actually be valid for the bare thermocouple. Uh, and so we don't actually ask you to calculate a theoretical expectation for the bare thermocouple, but do so for the 3 8 inch and 1 inch um, steel ball. Uh, and then the uh, thermocouple wire is actually in the way of the flow. And so it is not exactly flow over a sphere, but with a cylinder attached to that sphere, um, which changes the assumption. Also, the flow isn't exactly laminar. I would say it is definitely in the turbulent region, um, which is another thing that's not so good about this assumption. For the first assumption we made was that the Biot number was really low, or in other words, um, the thermal conductivity was super high. Um, that's not exactly true. Um, for stainless steel, the thermal conductivity is a little low, and so the convection-only assumption is not a very good one. Uh, so with these poor assumptions, uh, we end up getting an uncertainty of about 30% of the heat transfer coefficient, which propagates into the time constant, which means that there is a huge offset from expectation and reality um, based upon the equation that we decided to use. However, despite this high uncertainty, the trends that you actually experience are still maintained, and so it is valuable from the perspective of knowing how for instance, mass, area, or flow rate um, will uh, impact the uh, rate of cooling. The other method that we're going to be using for calculating the time constant is the 36.8% method. Now, because this is a first order system, um, we can rearrange that equation to fit this, this form. Um, and then take an in integral of this to get the error fraction. 
um, which I'll leave the math work for you to do later. And so the value of this is it gives you a ratio of the temperature with respect to ambient um, divided by the initial temperature with respect to ambient. Um, and that is an exponential decay function um, once you know what the time constant is. And so if you were to set time equal to tau, this right side becomes e to the negative 1. e to the negative 1 is also equal to 0.368, therefore 36.8% method. Uh, and you can solve for what temperature um, one time constant should occur at. And you can then determine from that point uh, what time uh, you're experiencing that temperature at, and that is therefore equal to the time constant. Now, a note about this is this is a rough estimate only because you're taking uh, two data points, uh, one on either side, and interpolating to get to that temperature, uh, which means you have a very low sample amount and therefore a very high uncertainty. Uh, and so this basically acts as a sanity check. Here we got linear regression. Uh, which takes that equation from the last slide um, for the error fraction, takes the natural log of that, which removes the exponent term and turns this into a linear function. And so this linear function therefore fits a y equals mx plus b format, where y is the natural log of gamma, m is negative 1 over tau, x is time, and then there's no remaining um, pieces here, so you should set the intercept equal to zero if you're using like the linest function. Uh, some notes about this is that there's a lot of noise in the um, high and low region of your plot, so you actually want to remove anything outside of the uh, 10 to 90 percent region. This actually is a lot more accurate than the 36.8 percent method just because you have a lot more samples that you'll be taking for your measurements. Uh, and so these two methods together give a lot more concrete proof that the time constant is being calculated correctly and is very different from theory. Now the uncertainty for uh, the time constant for this method can be derived from your slope information. So the linest output should give you an uncertainty of slope that you need to multiply by the t value in order to get to the 95% uh, confidence form. But once you get u sub m, you can propagate that into u sub t. All right, um, that is everything that I've got for you. I hope you found this helpful, uh, and good luck with your uh, experiment.